Gabi. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to say good morning, Edinburgh. I just wanted to say that. It's great to be here. I'll just get myself organised here, get all my little odds and ends sorted out. I like odds and ends. It helps me talk. Um, my talk today, I've decided to call four questions I'd like to ask myself. So I guess it's like a politician to be sure that you, you know, get the answers you want to talk about. You make sure that the questions are organised as well. But these are actually questions I get asked a lot. So hopefully they will, they'll be questions that you'd like to hear the answers to as well. And the very first one is a question that's actually unique to me. It's not one of those questions that all authors get asked. And that question is, is Garth Nix your real name? Because it sounds like the perfect made-up name for a writer of fantasy. I mean, you just, you just automatically think, okay, that guy's got to be a writer of fantasy books with a name like that. And actually, it is my real name. It's not a pseudonym, even though it's perfect for it. I mean, one of the other things about it, of course, is Nix is in the middle of the alphabet. And when authors gather, as they do, to discuss what pseudonyms they would like to have, it seems to be a very common thing with authors. We all want to have pseudonyms for some reason. There's a sort of an attraction about making up pseudonyms, whether you use them or not. And one of the theories about pseudonyms is you should choose one, your surname, it's in the middle of the alphabet. Because when the books are put on a bookshelf in a bookstore, I start at A on the top left and I go down to Z on the bottom right, something in the middle, like N, will be exactly at eye height as you walk in. <laughs> So, I've got the perfect name for a writer of fantasy. But it's also unusually appropriate because both my names can also be found in the dictionary. I don't think that's very common. Now, Garth, of course, means a walled courtyard or a walled garden, like a cloister Garth in a church. It's not all that interesting. Nix, one of the meanings of Nix is nothing. I prefer to ignore that one because I don't really want to be Mr. Nothing, you know? <laughs> Hi, I'm Garth Nothing. Doesn't sound very good. But much, much more appropriately for me, Nix is also a very old Germanic or Teutonic word for a merman or a water sprite. And if you look up Nix in the dictionary, if you look up Nix in the dictionary, you'll see that's one of the, you know, Nix, Nixie, Nissa. They're all, all words referring to these, these mermen or water sprites. But my, my favourite uh, account of what, a, of what a Nix actually is comes from Encyclopedia Britannica, which I believe started in Edinburgh, even though it's Encyclopedia Britannica many, many years ago. If you look up Nix in Encyclopedia Britannica, either online or in one of the 10 billion trillion print editions that are still all over the place, it says something along the lines of that a Nix is a creature from Germanic myth, half human, half fish, that's able to assume human form, generally that of an aged crone, <laughs> a young maiden, or an Australian author. <laughs> Actually. It, it doesn't say that. I feel it should. And in fact, maybe in you know, one of the future revisions of Britannica, they will eventually get up to that. And again, according to myth and legend, Nixers are usually malevolent. They don't like people. They live in the bottoms of lakes and rivers in beautiful underwater palaces. They obviously haven't seen my house. Um, I don't think I'd like to live in an underwater one anyway. Beautiful underwater palaces. And they typically interacted with humans in only two ways. They used to either lure them down to the bottom of their lakes to drown them or marry them, one or the other. It was like death or marriage. Now, what's the choice? You've been dragged to the bottom of the lake. It's like, will you marry me or drown? It's not much of a question, is it? Um, but I like to think that maybe long, long ago, one of these mythological Nixers actually married a human, and maybe I'm descended from one of these, one of these mythological creatures. So, Garth Nix is an absolutely appropriate name for a writer of fantasy. Maybe by being given that name, I was always going to be a writer of fantasy. My parents, by the way, claim that they didn't call me Garth after the comic strip character, which is in the Daily Mail, I think, in the UK, and was in a, a paper in Melbourne, The Herald Sun. And Garth, the comic strip character, which some of you may know, was very popular in the 50s and 60s, and I was born in 1963. My whole family finds it very amusing that Garth, the comic strip character, is this hugely muscled man with enormously broad shoulders and mighty, mighty muscles and a very small head. I, on the other hand, am not particularly muscled and I have a very large head. <laughs> my, uh, my brothers in particular think this is, this is enormously amusing. Um, now, the next question I'm going to ask myself is, 
how did you get started writing? Because again, this is something people are always interested to know. You know, when did I start writing? How did I end up, you know, writing lots of books and so on? And I actually got started writing earlier than I remembered. I mean, if you'd asked me this question at, at, at one point, I would have said, you know, I started writing stories in my sort of teenage years and so on. But a few years ago at Christmas, at a Christmas lunch, my younger brother pulled out a little book Something like this. This is, this is actually a facsimile because the, the original is in the Smithsonian. Um, <laughs> no, I, I actually couldn't find the original. I was looking for it just before I left. And I have a, I have a bunch of, um, of old you know, stories that I've written and so on, and, but I, I couldn't find where I put them. They, you know, when you put something special, very safe, and then you can't find it ever again. So this is a facsimile of a little book that my brother produced at a Christmas lunch with my family and said, you know, I found this when we were cleaning up under my parents' house. And it's a little book called Stories by Garth Nix. And I thought he'd made it just to poke fun at me because this is the sort of thing that brothers do. But my parents said, oh, we remember that. We remember that little book of stories. And this little book of stories, Stories by Garth Nix, only had three stories in it, had probably my very first published story. Admittedly self-published, but you know, you've got to start somewhere. And I'm gonna read you the story. It's quite long, so be prepared. A boy went outside, it started raining coins, he picked them up. That's it. <laughs> now, when I was given that little book, I was quite encouraged because, okay, it's not a great story. It's, it's not, not gonna be immortalized, that story, but it's got a beginning, a middle, and an end. So maybe even when I was seven, I was thinking about the structure of stories because a, a lot of story is structure. It's about how you, you put a story together. So that was my, my very, very first my very, very first self-publication. Then I went on, I wrote, I wrote stories through, through my teens, you know, for the school magazine and so on, not, not that many. But I had no plans to be a writer. I wasn't particularly thinking of being a writer. In fact, right up until the end of my school years, I thought I was gonna join the army and be an army officer. But when I was 17, I joined our equivalent of the territorial army and became a part-time soldier. And a few years of being a part-time soldier convinced me I didn't want to be a full-time one. So, which was a good lesson. I actually enjoyed that experience, but I also worked out that that wasn't what I wanted to do. So I had to suddenly change my whole plans you know, for, for the future. And that all sort of came together when I was actually traveling here in the United Kingdom. I, I worked for a year to save money. I had an incredibly boring job as a pay clerk for the Australian Public Service where I, filled, I coded computer forms for a year. I had to remember all the codes to you know, change people's pay and so on. It was immensely boring, but it was quite a lot of time for thinking other thoughts, so maybe it was also good training for, for being a writer. Then I came to the United Kingdom and I bought this beat up Austin 1600 with a gold flame stripe down the bonnet that made it go much faster. <laughs> and I drove all around, all over England, Scotland and Wales, and I reread a lot of my favourite childhood books where they were set. So I reread Alan Garner's The, the Weird Snow Brisingerman in Cheshire. I read Rosemary Sutcliffe's The Eagle of the Ninth on Hadrian's Wall. Um, I read Robert Louis Stevenson in Scotland. Uh, you know, I read Arthur Ransom in, in the Lake District and so on. And I also started to write. And I, I bought this beat up, everything was beat up, my car, a beat up typewriter, a secondhand Silver Reed typewriter. And I wrote the first story that I actually sold on that typewriter. And I'm very sad that I don't have it anymore because I ended up at the end of my trip, I was so broke that I had to sell my typewriter in order to get the bus fare to Heathrow just to get home. I had a ticket, but I couldn't get to Heathrow because I had no money. So that was when I started really thinking I, I wanted to be a writer. And I wrote most of a novel in that time when I was traveling around, a novel called Captain of the Guard. Now, funny enough, you won't have ever seen this book because I never finished it. And it was a le I should have learned a lesson that I learned a bit later on. And it's a very important lesson for authors is that you need to finish things before anything can happen. And which seems sort of obvious, but it, it, it wasn't to me at that time. And in fact, a, a famous author who I can't remember, which is quite typical of most of, of people that I quote, I think that's a fantastic quote, and I can't remember who said it. I, I think an American author said, the only difference between an amateur author and a professional one is that professionals finish things. And I should have learned that, but I didn't. And so I didn't finish that book, nothing could happen with it. I went back to Australia and I wrote other things, I wrote various stories and so on. But in fact, my next publication is also a book you'll have never seen here. This is quite an unusual little book. Again, it started off as an exercise in self-publishing, though it then ended up being published by someone else. And in 1988, this is really my first book. 
It's called Very Clever Baby's First Reader. And some friends of mine were having a baby, and they were sure that that baby would be the cleverest baby ever born. And I thought, well, I'm sure that's true. That baby will be immensely clever. So I made them a little card, just a little card book to say congratulations on the birth of their baby. And this little book, Very Clever Baby's First Reader, features Freddy the Fish and his easy words. And it begins, this is Freddy Fish. The study of fish is called ichthyology. <laughs> and it goes on to, uh, you know, things like, Freddy is called a fish because he is a completely aquatic vertebrate. <laughs> now, interestingly, and it says it's for very clever babies aged three to six months. Now, I made this for my friend's very clever baby, and then I made some more because other people were having, having children. And I ended up having to make these little booklets all the time for friends who were having babies who wanted to have one to give to their child. And then I ended up uh, self-publishing it, and then, in fact, an, uh, an Australian publisher took them on as well. But a bookseller friend of mine who sold them said it's very interesting because roughly about 20% of the people who picked up this book just didn't get it. They'd look at it, and they'd, they'd open it, and they'd read ichthyology, and I'd say, but a baby couldn't read that. <laughs> There's no way a baby could read ichthyology. And then the bookseller would point out that babies can't read at all. That, that actually is the joke. And then they'd look blankly back at him and say, but babies can't read ichthyology. So it's an interesting test. So that was actually my very first book. And it was followed by very clever babies Ben-Hur, <laughs> with Freddie the Fish as Charlton Heston. And that begins with, uh, this is Ben-Hur. He is a prince of Jerusalem. He's also a fish. And uh, followed by, this is very much ahead of its time, I felt, very Clever Baby's Guide to the Greenhouse Effect <laughs> with Professor Frederick Fish. <coughs> so, in around 1988 to 1990, those were the books that, in fact, I was known for in Australia. And I started to think, and I was writing a novel at that time, and I started to think, oh dear, I'm going to be known for these funny little joke books about very clever babies that sit next to the till. I'm never going to have a, a proper book published because I hadn't finished my first novel I, still, I wasn't finishing my second novel. And my second novel was The, the Rag Witch. But it's my first published novel. This is the British cover. It actually came out in Australia in 1991. My books didn't start appearing in uh, the UK until 2002. Uh, I'll come back to that a bit later. But I started off in Australia and then America much earlier. So that's the British cover of The Rag Witch. The Rag Witch took me five years to write, very off and on. Because I was very slow, I think, to learn that I actually needed to finish it. I couldn't just be someone who was always writing a novel. You've actually got to finish them sometimes.